Hello, Byzantine history students. This is the promised recorded lecture, if a bit late. The 5th century, part 1, political history. I encourage you, as you listen to the lecture, to have some note paper next to you. You hear my own note paper rattling beside me. And write down questions you may have regarding this lecture so we can talk them over when we again meet face to face. I haven't had so much difficulty constructing a lecture in quite some time. The 5th century is given rather short shrift by uh, Timothy Gregory in the Byzantine history book, and for good reason. He's focusing on the East, but there are many things that are happening in the other half of the empire, the West, that uh, are critical to understand the history of Europe. I've wrestled with this for s many hours, actually. I, I, it's almost embarrassing thinking how long I sor tried sorting out the topics I was going to or not going to cover in the 5th century. And I've decided that it behooves us to consider the things that were going on in the West in, in a, quite a bit greater detail than Gregory has in his book. So there's going to be a lot more material in this lecture than you have in your book. I've divided the Western material for the 5th century, or the material total for the 5th century, into three parts. One is going to cover the general political history, that's this part one, which you see on your screen right now. The second is going to cover the church history, the councils, Ephesus and Chalcedon particularly, which occur during the 5th century, and how this affects uh, the history of the empire. The third is I am going to set aside, and we may not even cover this before the next exam, but I think it's very important to take a clear look at what's going on among the so-called invading Germanic tribes. Now, they really weren't invading, as you probably ascertained from reading the history of the Battle of Adrianople in Gregory's textbook. They were more <laughs> fleeing for refuge. This was political asylum on the part of the Germanic tribes. But because of some really horrible uh, mistakes on the part of the emperors east and west, the political situation caused by the coming of the Germanic tribes, or the Volke der the movement, the migration of, of Germanic peoples in the 5th century, led to what's commonly considered a collapse of the Roman Empire in the West, certainly by 476 uh, CE, or what used to be called AD, there is no Roman Empire in any way, shape, or form in Western Europe, yet the East retains its identity as the Roman Empire, what we now call Byzantium, of course. So, because there is so much involved with modern politics, to be honest, the understanding between East and West, why do Western people, the peoples of Western Europe and America, see the world one way, and Eastern people, the people of the Mideast and Eastern Europe, to be honest, see things in a very different way? This goes back to some of the events of the 5th century. Uh, the, the Western identity which you and I have inherited as citizens of America is an identity of the invading barbarian tribes. We have developed a legal system which is a mix of the Roman Empire and Germanic tribal structure. We've developed social expectations which depend far more than anywhere else in the world on a very specific history in the Germanic tribes. So because of this, because we need to know who we are today, I am going to uh, spend a little extra time considering the West as opposed to the East, where Gregory's focus is almost entirely. I'm sitting here by a fire with a warm beverage in the middle of the night, so if you hear pauses as I stop to sip my warm be beverage, please understand, I'm sitting in my socks making a recording, and this is not the usual energy level I have in a lecture. I beg your pardon. 
The 5th century, more than the 4th, is a century of change, and so Gregory ends his discussion of the 4th century as a century of change, but I'm going to move that title to the 5th century. Theodosius I died in 395 at the age of 48. It's clear that there were a lot of loose ends when he died. He left much of what he intended to do unfinished, particularly in regard to the so-called barbarians uh, that were now residents of the Roman Empire. It's important to note, for historical purposes, that the unified Roman Empire, East and West, ceased to exist after Theodosius. He was the last true emperor. Imperium, imperator, in Latin means uh, single ruler. And so it's a little bit incorrect to talk about emperors of East and West, since the, the name itself implies a single head of state. And he was the last true emperor, single head of state of the Roman Empire. While Theodosius's death did not throw the empire immediately into chaos, as we've seen with other deaths of other emperors, particularly in the third century, his unfinished program of assimilating the Gothic tribes, and a program it was, proved to have dire consequences for the western half of the empire. Theodosius had taken the mess left to him by Valens, and the failed policy of Valens, which resulted in the Battle of Adrianople and the death of Valens, was something that Theodosius rectified with his carefully constructed policy toward the Goths, uh, proscribing Arian Christianity, preferring Nicene Christianity as a way of separating the, uh, the newly immigrated, to be fair to what they were, they were immigrants, the newly immigrated Gothic peoples from the old Roman aristocracy, this was a shrewd move to prevent the aristocracy and the Goths from coming to blows. But the policy was unfinished. And we're going to take a much greater look at that when we talk about the Germanic peoples per se. But for now, we have to uh, simply acknowledge that Theodosius had plans that went entirely the wrong way after his death. For the sake of understanding the 5th century, I want to break the whole discussion into three separate lectures. This that you're listening to is the first, which deals with the political history covering the rulers themselves, and I will talk about the Goths, the Germanic tribes, and Western Europe, with the Western Empire, to the extent that it's necessary to understand the political changes that occur. At a social-cultural level, the, the question of assimilating the Goths is a critical one to understanding the changes that occur that separate what we usually think of as the ancient or classical antique, antique world, world of classical antiquity, from the so-called medieval period. And we'll look at that when we look at the Germanic tribes. The second lecture, which may or may not come to you recorded, the one I certainly want you to listen to before uh, next Wednesday, is this one. But the second one will deal with the complex and, in some ways, very tedious religious history, which covers the Third and Fourth Ecumenical Councils, the development of the split at Chalcedon. This is important stuff. Um, many of you may find it pretty uh, detailed. It's, it's not the way we like to think of important matters in our society. We don't, we don't sit down and parse out, did God have two natures or one when he became a human being and had to share a human nature with his divine nature? This isn't the way modern Christians usually sort things out. The reason you need to know it is because it made huge differences in the politics of the Byzantine world. And if we're not in a history course to study ourselves, but truly to learn about other people, we have to learn what mattered to them. And these religious differences, bizarre and philosophical as they may seem to us as 21st century uh, Western thinkers, were precisely the things that mattered most, even to the peasants of the Byzantine world. And so we have to know that, know these issues, if we're going to understand them. We have to know the history of religion if we're going to understand the people who uh, valued these issues so highly. And the third thing, and this may not happen before 
the uh, next test, but I think it's critical since in the modern world, East and West are definitely divided. This is something my colleague, Dr. Stanfield Johnson, and I speak on a great deal together. Uh, the Muslim world, the so-called Mideast, and the Eastern world generally, including everything in Hungary and the Balkan Peninsula, over to Latvia and Lithuania, the Ukraine and Russia, they have a worldview which shares certain assumptions which Western Europe and the Americas do not. If you're going to understand the world in which you live, if you're going to understand what the reporters who bring you stories about, say, Vladimir Putin do not, you must understand the very different mindset that exists between East and West, and this goes back a full 1,500 years, 16, 1,700 years, really, to the barbarian dominance of the West, a phenomenon which did not occur in the East. It's a bit wrong to call what happened in the West the fall of Rome, but we'll get to that in due time. Oh, there's my dog barking at wolves. After Theodosius I, Theodosius had attempted to solve the old problem of succession by making it very clear the people who would follow him in office as emperor were his sons, Arcadios and Honorius. Uh, oh, I didn't put the Eastern spelling for Honorius. I know you care. As Caesars. He named them as Caesars. This by the old system under Diocletian, the, what, the decayed version of what had been the Tetrarchy, meant that Arcadius and Honorius would be the next emperors. Upon his death, however, which he had not planned, I think, but happened anyway when he was about 48, Arcadius was a mere 17 years old and Honorius was 11. Never fear, Theodosius was a smart guy and he planned for this. Arcadius would hold court in the east, Honorius in the west. Until they came of age, each would be guided and advised by two experienced rulers chosen personally by Theodosius to take control after Theodosius died, if such an event would happen. Arcadius would be under the care of Rufinus, a military commander and, and courtier in Constantinople, Honorius would be under the control of Stilicho, who was a Roman. I want to emphasize that because he's often called a barbarian, and I don't think that's, that's at all fair or accurate. What it, what it is is a reflection of the type of biases which exist today, and to some degree existed in the 5th century. He happened to have a barbarian or vandal father, but he was raised as a Roman, he lived as a Roman, he was thoroughly acculturated. For all intents and purposes, he was as much a Roman citizen as anyone else was in the 4th and 5th centuries. It soon became apparent upon the death of Theodosius I that the political shrewdness by which he balanced the interests of his Gothic generals and their armies against the old political class of the empire was lacking in his sons, if not in their advisors. Upon being given the title of what was essentially general, upon not being given, I'm sorry, upon being rejected for the title of what, a, what we would call a general after Theodosius' death, a Gothic chieftain by the name of Alaric, whom we will get to know much better in the discussion on the Germanic tribes, the third section of this lecture series, rose in revolt, and his way of showing his displeasure was to burn towns to the ground and enslave the occupants, kill them, rape, pillage. This, this was Alaric's way of throwing a little temper tantrum that he had been passed over for a distinctly Roman title of master of the military, which is the equivalent of general. The area in which he was doing this was just to the northwest of Constantinople in the Iberian Peninsula. Arcadius screwed up. That's my take on it, and a lot of, uh, a lot of other scholars will, will voice similar uh, opinions of what happened. He had the opportunity to give Alaric everything he wanted by simply giving him the title of Magister Militum, 
who cares if you have two or three? Uh, the, the going wisdom at the time is you couldn't have more than one supreme head of the military, magister militum, in, Const in the Constantinople area, but this there was no precedent for for limiting it to one. Uh, there were two or three or four. Caesar had five magister milita uh, under his command as when he was emperor. So what we have is a chance for for Arcadius to buy off. Alaric with the extremely cheap price of naming him a Roman general, giving him essentially citizen status and legitimacy within the empire, and he refused. The reason he refused appears to be bias against the barbarians. They were not the type of people that the Roman gentry, the Roman ruling classes, wanted to think of as their generals or as their elite uh, fighting force. Rufinus, who was, of course, Arcadius's advisor, the guy designated by Theodosius to make sure that Arcadius basically didn't screw up as emperor. Rufinus was killed by his own soldiers while fighting Alaric, and this happened within months after the death of Theodosius. So uh, Arcadius did not have the benefit of Rufinus's insight or his father's choice for an advisor for more than a few months. The man who replaced him was a eunuch by na the name of Eutropius, who seems to have shared, if not fostered, the anti-barbarian tendencies of Arcadius. Eutropius was the product of the old senatorial system. He was a court functionary. He didn't like barbarians, they did not understand the basics of civilization, and he despised them for not appreciating the value of olive trees, red wine, um, the Greek language, and other things, well, you know, bathing, that, that Eutropius regarded as the benchmark of civilization. So Alaric's fate, Alaric's hopes, to be accepted in Roman society were repeatedly dashed politically by the court of uh, Arcadius, especially under the advice of Eutropius. So Alaric remained in rebellion. At this point, he could have been bought off easily, but he wasn't. He set up an independent kingdom in the Balkans, where all of the formerly Roman towns were subject to barbarian rule, or Gothic rule, Although, if you were to ask Alaric, he would say he was a Roman who was in rebellion against the emperor. He never really thought of himself as a barbarian, if he, even if he dressed, acted, and smelled like one. This was right on the back doorstep of the imperial city of Constantinople. And that meant that Arcadius had a serious diplomatic issue for as long as, as uh, Alaric was there. Ironically, and this is the point I was just making really, what Alaric always wanted most was not uh, self-aggrandizement except as a member of the Roman hierarchy. He was a vain and very proud individual. He bragged to his fellow Goths that he was the greatest of the Roman generals, which is a tough thing to brag about since the Romans don't regard you as a general. They regard you as a mercenary captain. So he wanted legitimacy to put behind his boasting. But a, were he to have that, that's all he really was asking for at this point in time. Alaric was gregarious, he was charismatic. His fellow Goths admired him. He was regarded by the Roman aristocracy as something of a windbag. But he's a windbag with a hell of a big army. And they should have taken that into account and perhaps just tossed a title his direction when they had the chance. That's at least my take on things. Alaric will play out in many slides to follow. It didn't improve Alaric's mood 
when a rival and fellow Goth, a fellow by the name of Gainas, did receive the title Magister Militum, General, in the year 399. Well, crap, you named him General. Why not me? That's Alaric's take on it. There wasn't a good reason for this. It should not be as see seen as anything but an attempt by the Emperor Arcadius to appease Gainas. For some reason, Arcadius felt that Gainas needed to be tossed the bone of, of being titled Magister Militum, and Alaric did not. The general mistrust of Gothic tribes led to a faction of senators in Constantinople trying to remove Gainas from his position almost as soon as he received it. So, it's hard to believe that Alaric would have fared better politically had he been given the title as well, or instead of Gainas. And perhaps Alaric should have taken note of just how strong the anti-barbarian sentiment was in Rome by looking at the fate of Gainas. Gainas, upon being threatened with an ouster, by uh, the Roman senators in Constantinople, responded by attacking Constantinople. Bad move. The citizens themselves rode up, rose up against the Germans in the town, particularly Gainas's folks, but almost anyone who was wearing trousers and smelled like rancid butter and like they hadn't bathed in a while, or perhaps like they cooked in animal fat rather than olive oil, all of them were targets, and it was a, it was a riot that drove Gainas and the Germans not just his, but every German citizen that was in or near Constantinople out of the city. When he fled, the Huns, who were now occupying the territory across the Danube, caught up with him, and in circumstances that aren't quite clear, it appears that some chieftain among the Huns personally killed Gainas. Huns were like that. Eutropius died... Uh, apparently of natural causes, though that's always a, a toss-up when it comes to Byzantine history. But with the death of Eutropius, there was a situation in, the real, in which the real power behind the throne of Constantinople was now the wife of Arcadius, Eudoxia. She had been his wife for four years already. It's interesting that the history of this period of, of Constantinople is told in terms of who is running the emperor, not who the emperor is. So, Rufinos, um, Eutropios, and then Eudoxia are the ones who are considered the power players, and Arcadios himself is considered something of a, of a puppet for these folks. She didn't win her husband a whole lot of favors, and the reason which I wish I had more time to go into because it's, it's drama worthy of Jerry Springer. She uh, earned the enmity. I don't say that she didn't deserve it. She certainly earned the enmity of one of the most popular people in all of the Eastern Empire, a uh, bishop by the name of John Chrysostom, who had risen from being a very popular speaker. He's an Arab, by the way, in his native Syria, he was uh, an Antiochene priest who became the Bishop of Antioch and then was promoted to the Bishop of Constantinople, the Patriarch of Constantinople, we call him now. And he had no use for the Empress because the public image of the Empress was anything but Christian. She claimed to be a Christian, and he was willing to say in sermons, hey, Christians don't do that. And he said it many times, and he never said sorry. She personally arranged for the exile of this very popular preacher twice. He, for his part, would never take back the statements he made about her morality in his sermons. Specifically, he called her a whore. He said she'll sleep with anything that God created to move under the sun, and... Uh, not, not having any evidence to the contrary, he never took it back. Now, the way to think of a person like John Chrysostom in the 4th century and the early 5th century, he's not like a televangelist. He's not a TV preacher. He's not popular because he, uh, he slings lingo. He's popular because he walks the walk. 
and he became a folk hero because he was willing to stand up to just about anything that constituted injustice. If the rich were hoarding their money, he would preach sermons in which he mentioned them by name as people who did not support their poorer neighbors. Frequently, this caused such shame among the upper classes that they would cough up money and apologize to Chrysostom, even confess their sins to him and uh, ask his forgiveness. So he, uh, I'm not sure at all. I, he was a smart guy. I doubt he expected that the Empress would confess her sins and apologize, but he certainly, being a sincere guy, was not going to back down when he thought she represented anything but the Christian ideal of a woman, a wife, and an empress. So she kicked him out of the city twice, which caused the populace to have very little use for her, and of course, having very little use for her, they blame her husband, who is the emperor, after all. Hey, you married her, dude. Eudoxia died in 404 uh, as, as a result of complications of childbirth, and her position as the puppet master was filled by a career politician, that, a person whose name you will need to know for the next test, because this guy really kept the empire from falling apart. Anthemius. He had skill. He had wisdom. He made sure that he balanced diplomacy with uh, genuine, genuine tact and skill at war. He would have been a great emperor. He was probably a better puppet master for the emperor. That way he wasn't a target. In 408, Arcadius died suddenly. This would have great implications for the empire both east and west, not because Arcadius can be remembered as a great emperor. He died at age 29 or 30, having accomplished absolutely nothing but being manipulated by other people. He was succeeded by his son, Theodosius, who at the time was a seven-year-old. It's Theodosius II, this is. Frequently, in Eastern cultures, the, uh, a person's son is named after a person's father. So, if your dad was Theodosius, you're not going to be named Theodosius. You're going to be named after your grandpa. Your son, you will name Theodosius in honor of grandpa. And this pattern is clearly evident in a lot of the things we're going to be looking at in the next, oh, thousand years of Byzantine history. So in 408, Arcadius died, and the empire, many factions within the empire, saw this transition as a time to attempt to seize power. We'll see how that fares in the West with the fate of a, uh, probably the greatest general that the divided empire knew the empire since Constantine knew, a fellow by the name of Stilicho. Anthemios remained in control until he died sometime in the year 414 or 415. We don't know because the dates on documents do, are not listed in the empire according to uh, what we now think of as the birth of Christ or even the four-year uh, misalignment of the birth of Christ. Uh, so that Christ would have been born about, you know, 4 B.C. Those dates, dates that we use today just didn't function that way. There were, there were dates that were listed from the founding of Rome. There were dates that were listed from the founding of Constantinople. And as we compare documents, we can't be sure always what these dates mean. So we do know somewhere around what we would call the year 414 or 415 in the Common Era, Anthemius died. The key to understanding Athemius is to realize that he was all about stabilizing everything he could get his hands on. So that meant the Eastern Empire. Building walls, building fortifications, establishing economic systems which would uh, prevent spiraling inflation as we saw under Diocletian. The walls that he built around Constantinople were the walls that would remain the impregnable walls until the Turks borrowed some cannon from the Venetians and managed to end that theory in uh, 1453 and 54. The impregnable walls of Constantinople were built by Anthemios during the reign of Theodosius II. 
He reorganized the government, and he set in place policies both toward the barbarians on uh, the Roman side of the Danube and toward the Persians, which restored peace in the East. Now, sometimes Western scholars like to criticize the Byzantine rulers for buying off their enemies. Well, if you can do it, why not? That's my thought. If all the Persians require is say, a couple hundred pounds of gold a year not to wage war on you, that's a cheap price. Compared the, with the price of the actual war, that's nothing. The Byzantine Empire, thanks to mines and reserves of gold in, the, uh, in Asia Minor, didn't have to worry about gold. You can pay gold. What they did have to worry about was an attack which might destabilize the empire and cause the entire governmental system to fall. So, we think, partly because we're Western, that somebody who buys off their enemies is, you know, something of a shady player and they can't uh, stand up for themselves, perhaps they're a bit cowardly. I think that's, that's a little shallow on our end. If all I have to do is give, give somebody something I have plenty of, money, to keep them from, you know, waging war on me, that may not be a bad investment as long as I've got plenty of money. So hold that in mind. You're going to see this, this theme a lot, and I, I think there's a, a cultural bias we have which can prevent us from seeing the wisdom of what something like Anthemius was doing. At the very time when he's buying off the Persians, and then later Pulcheria, a, uh, the sister of the emperor, would buy off the Huns, at the very time they're doing that, they're stabilizing the economy at home, and they're preventing the cost of warfare, which would be much more than they're paying in ransom to keep people from attacking them. Anthemius then is replaced by a remarkable woman who should have a book written about her, except most modern readers would find it boring because she was something of a shrew, Pulcheria. But she was a powerful and very interesting shrew. She ran the empire for her entire life after the death of Anthemius, and she probably, I would say, she was something of the apprentice of Anthemius. She learned what she knew about running the empire from him. Now I want to turn my focus to the West. This is what Gregory does not cover, but I think it's critical. There's a watershed figure who has had books written about him and movies made about him, though none of them are any good with the exception of a few historical monographs, which are unfortunately very boring. The fellow's name is Stilico. You met him a couple of slides ago. He had a Vandal father and a Roman mother. He was the Western Empire's last great general, and he was good at what he did. Stilico, who was also the advisor to the... Uh, young Emperor Honorius, the 11-year-old in the West, he proved to be entirely up to the task. He could handle it. He knew how to run things. Uh, Theodosius I had chosen very well. The only problem Stilicho had, and this is worthy of a Shakespeare play, was that many who were members of the old, virtually defunct senatorial class in the, in the West, the ones who hadn't migrated east back in the day of Constantine, the, uh, I call them the old romantics of Rome, they despised him for his barbarian parentage. The fact that his dad wasn't a Roman is something they really held against Stilicho. Now that old senatorial class on the Italian peninsula, they, they were living in another century anyway, and their, their poor judgment really, really produced a catastrophe uh, with the death of Stilicho, and you could say their ignorance led to the fall of the Roman power in the West, but it would take some time for that to play out. Who were they? They were Romantics. They believed in the old Rome. They believed in the Rome of Julian the Apostate. They believed in the Rome of Diocletian. Many of them were the old pagan holdouts who regarded whatever was going on in Constantinople, though it had been going on there for uh, a century, Anything that's going on in the East, that's not truly 
Roman politics. That's not truly Roman government. Roman government was to be found on the Italian peninsula because that's where they were. They were posseurs. They didn't have uh, anything to back up their claims to power. They were, you know, a bunch of old blue blood aristocracy that didn't realize the world passed them by. And they were the downfall of the greatest warrior general of the West, Stilicho. Stilicho was perhaps the only Roman official, East or West, to realize the desperate military situation caused by the movement of the Germanic tribes, which he had spies and he had uh, reconnaissance missions reporting to him on a daily basis what was going on with the movement of the Germanic tribes. And the unrest in Western Europe was something that he knew couldn't bode well for the empire. In addition to advising the young emperor, Stilicho functioned as what we would call today a commander-in-chief of the Roman army in the West. He made all relevant decisions in military matters. And his word was the word that mattered. Keep, the, keep your eye on that idea because it uh, has some tragic results. Stilicho, personally, is the only reason that the barbarian chieftain, the windbag, who had massive army, armies to support his windbaggedness, Alaric, was contained. He accomplished this through apparently a mixture of military victories and diplomacy. It appears that he saw the value in manipulating and using the massive forces of the generally pro-Roman Alaric. Now this is an interesting feature. He has been criticized by Edward Gibbon. I'll talk more about Gibbon. He's an 18th century blue blood, fat, annoying uh, British aristocrat who wrote The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. I have no use for him, as you can tell by the, the way I talk about him. But Edward Gibbon thought uh, that Stilicho was foolish in, in leading Alaric along and, and not wiping him out when he had the chance. Stilicho realized that if he was going to survive, and if Rome was going to survive, the potential invasion of, of tribe after tribe of Germans who were being displaced in the warfare in their own land, then he would need a unified force that could be called upon at any time to defend the empire. And he didn't have enough soldiers to do it. So he saw Alaric as somebody who could be called upon in need to fight for Rome. After all, that's what Alaric wanted. He wanted to be a general of the Roman army. And so even when many times Stilicho beat Alaric on the battlefield, he always let him live, he always let him escape, and there was something of a tacit invitation to Alaric to come talk. Hey, we need to chat. There are bigger things than what we're doing going on. And... Uh, you and I can both be part of it, is the me message that Stilicho kept sending to Alaric. When Alaric moved west out of the Balkans to try his forces, his fortunes in Italy, uh, after all, the Balkans hadn't proved very, very healthy for him. He had his little kingdom in, in the Iberian, or the Balkan Peninsula, the uh, uh, Illyrican area of the Balkan Peninsula but he couldn't expand and he couldn't impress the uh, Romans to give him a title based on what he was doing, which was basically raping and pillaging when he got the chance. He moved to Italy, a much weaker Roman army as he thought existed in Italy, but he underestimated Stilicho. When Alaric moved west to see if he could besiege the western emperor Honorius, Stilicho followed the army everywhere it went. Now, Stilicho was operating both east and west, so it, it, was, it was a heck of an accomplishment for Stilicho to both follow Alaric and fulfill his obligations in, militarily in the Roman east, where he was called also to fight. But he did. When necessary, Stilicho, Stilicho beat Alaric. He beat Alaric at Milan when Alaric had the Roman emperor holed up in the imperial city, not Rome. Emperors are not to be found in Rome in the 4th and 5th centuries. They're to be found at places like Milan and Ravenna. Um, Alaric lost there. 
Al Alaric lost again in 402, huge battle at Palentia, uh, but he was allowed to go free. And in 403, at Verona, Stilicho finally pulled Alaric aside and said, Hey, I can keep kicking your butt, or we can talk about how you can get what you want, which is to be a Roman citizen and to be accepted by the Roman aristocracy, and I can get what I want, which is a massive army to defend us against what is clearly a threat that's about to break on the Roman Empire, the threat of the other Germanic tribes behind the Goths who are about to invade. Alaric agreed to go back to Illyrica, which he had left when he came to the Italian peninsula, and apparently he went back to Illyrica under orders from Stilicho. So Stilicho took his enemy, turned him in, into an ally, sent him back to Illyrica, and said, wait till I tell you what to do. Stilicho saw that the Eastern Empire at this time was not interested in defending itself against the coming invasion, which he recognized was going to happen within a couple years. So Stilicho demanded, and this was a dangerous move to make, but he demanded that Illyrica, the area uh, to the north in the Balkan Peninsula where Alaric was now housed again, that it be given over to the control of the West. He was willing to go to war with the eastern half of the empire if they didn't do it. He was that desperate to ensure that he had control of Illyrica. Illyrica, in and of itself, isn't worth anything. It is probably uh, the case that Stilicho was going to use Illyrica as a buffer zone with all of Alaric's massive Gothic forces to, uh, to keep the other Germanic tribes, and in, indeed the Huns now who had moved into the area, vicious, nasty people by anyone's account, from crossing the Danube and causing untold disaster in the area of the empire. He was casting the die, and he was willing to risk his entire political reputation if it meant keeping the people of, of the old traditional empire, the people of, of south of the Danube and west of the Rhine, safe from the disaster that he saw coming. The East said, like hell, we're not giving you Illyrica. It may be a backwater and Alaric may be there hanging out with his Goths, but we're not giving it over to your control. In 405, Stilicho's prediction proved correct. An assortment of Germanic tribes, uh, Alans, Vandals, and Suaves, under the command of a powerful chieftain, Radagaisus, invaded Illyrica, and apparently their intent was to sack both Rome and Constantinople, effectively reducing the empire to rubble and taking over themselves. Well, the Goths who were already there were ready to fight for their homeland, even if, it, even if the Romans who, who were their neighbors didn't respect them as fellow citizens. They were ready to fight, and so was Stilicho. Stilicho quickly organized a coalition army. Alaric was already on his side, of course. He also... Uh, just by force of personality, took control of whatever forces were in the neighborhood in the east, some of the local legions, and he also recruited to ensure that there would be reserve troops, people to clean up after the battle. He recruited, recruited a miscellany of slaves and peasants who would uh, advance their fortunes, or in the case of slaves, earn their freedom by fighting for the empire. The result was that he beat he and his ragtag group of a massive army beat Radagaisus, but the senatorial class was not impressed. It's almost a Star Wars-like uh, plot here. The senators just don't get it that what Stilicho had done was save the empire. They were concerned that he had upset the social order, especially in his alliance with Alaric. The year 406 proved fateful for Stilicho. For his assistance in driving back Radagaisus, Stilicho offered Alaric what Alaric had so desperately wanted. He offered him the title Magister Militum, and he offered, also offered him the payment that was overdue 
for the many times that Alaric had fought in behalf of the empire. From the senator's position, to be fair, Alaric had sacked and raped and pillaged his way across a number of areas, and they thought, well, hell, you got your payment, you took it. Uh, Stilicho said, no, that's not the way you deal with, with a powerful barbarian leader. If he's demanding payment based on the fact that he fought for the empire, you pay him what you owe, and then, you know, take the better part of valor here. Then if he has wrongs that need to be redressed, you handle that with diplomacy. But he also gave him the title Magister Militum, which was the cause of the problem way back when, when Alaric first started rebelling. It's pretty certain that Theodosius I had planned on making Alaric Magister Militum, and it was only uh, his son and his advisor and the son's advisors that reneged on the promise which Theodosius had clearly made. What Stilicho was doing then was fulfilling a promise that had been made to Alaric by a, the legitimate emperor during the legitimate emperor's lifetime, and something that Alaric thought he was owed was being paid. 406 was also a year, and I don't have this as a bullet point, in which the Rhine, 406 and 407 that winter, the Rhine froze over solid, and what happened is under pressure from uh, the Eastern invaders, the Huns and other groups that were coming in from Central Asia, many Germanic tribes crossed the Rhine and said, hey, the Romans aren't really doing anything in Gaul anyway, let's settle down here and become part of the Roman, uh, the Roman Empire. So what was seen by them as a way of crossing a river that's going to protect you from invaders to the east was seen by the Romans as an invasion of further Gothic or Germanic tribes. Also in 406, because of this movement and the fact that nobody from Rome was seeming to respond to the concerns of the Roman Empire in the north, Britain and Gaul, the Roman gem general Constantine III, uh, uh, Romano-Britain, uh, rebelled and was proclaimed emperor by the army of the north. You've seen this happen before. That's how Constantine the Great got his position as well. Well, Constantine the Third is proclaimed in much the same pattern. What this means is you've got civil war in the West because you have a rival emperor set up over against Honorius the Kid. Stilicho met Constantine III in battle as Constantine moved south and beat him that same year, but because of limited resources and concern over how many Goths he could legitimately use in fighting Constantine, Stilicho could not finish the job. What he did was establish a new boundary. He used the Alps as a military bulwark and refused to let Constantine come farther south than the Alps. Strategically, it was a good move. It was a smart move. But what rankled the old Roman senatorial class, the, uh, the chattering classes of the, of the Roman world, was that he had lost all of that territory north of the Alps to Constantine. Well, you know, settle down. How many times has the north risen in rebellion? The only reason we don't think of Constantine I as a breakaway emperor is he managed to conquer Rome at the Battle of Melvian Bridge. Uh, otherwise, the 3rd century saw all of Gaul and Britain separated from Rome for decades, and the Roman chattering classes are now concerned that Stilicho didn't take back everything that the rebels had claimed overnight. Well, come on. Study your own history. Give him some years. That would be my argument. You can tell I'm kind of in favor of Stilicho. Maybe it's because I myself am of mixed ethnicity, and uh, I... It's hard not to see a guy of, of Stilicho's merit getting the short end of the stick from a, a bunch of people who themselves would never bother taking the field as generals. Continued lack of success with Constantine, which means he wasn't taking back the territory, as well as his favor toward Alaric, 
was considered a failure by the patricians at Ravenna. Ravenna is, of course, where the real government in the Italian peninsula is. Rome is just a symbolic backwater at this point. But the senators at Ravenna saw the means, it seems, through these so-called failures, the fact that he didn't, you know, completely slaughter Constantine in a year or less, and the fact that he happened to see Alaric as as much an ally as anything, this gave them uh, the opportunity to give vent to old rivalries and their own anti-Germanic bigotries. I don't know how else to put it, so I just put it that way on the slide. It was bigotry. In 408, and these are probably false, but rumors spread that Stilicho had arranged the death of Rufinus. I think these rumors were spread by the Roman senators on the Italian peninsula themselves. The ruling class didn't like Stilicho succeeding, so they spread rumors that would, that would sour Stilicho's own troops against their commander, even though up to that point they had really respected him. Uh, but he must have caused the death of Rufinus, which means, like him as you will, capable as he is, deep down he's really an evil guy. You just haven't realized it yet. Unrest spread through the Western army under the rumor that Stilicho had somehow arranged the death of Rufinus, and this led to a mutiny in the town, a fortified town of Tinicum, where the army was. The mutiny occurred on August 13 of 408. Because of the mutiny, Stilicho was recalled to Ravenna and sentenced to death. He was a traitor now to the Roman cause. And yup, it's his enemies that have arranged the whole thing. Stilicho, probably because he saw himself as a faithful son of Rome, did not appeal the decision of his death sentence. He had the right to appeal because he was a citizen. He was not a barbarian. He had the right to appeal. He had the right to have the case set before him, and he did not. He simply accepted the sentence of death. Arguably, Stilicho did this because he thought that by removing himself, he would remove the target of the anger of the senators. He couldn't have been more wrong. What followed sealed the destiny of the western half of the empire. That's why I'm spending time with Stilicho. He truly is a watershed figure. After the death of Stilicho, the senators arranged for military action and frankly plain old riots which would target Germanic tribesmen and their families. These are the very people who had been welcomed to live in the Italian peninsula by the quota system and to defend Italy as federati, as people in the service of Rome, uh, if Rome were ever attacked. So they were, they were warriors in the service of Rome, but because they were Germanic, they and their families were targeted in spite of their re residency status, and they were slaughtered in a combination of military actions and mob violence. This is... it's, it's hard to call it anything but genocide, or an attempt at genocide, to be honest. And it had a very predictable backfire effect on the senators who orchestrated it. What happened is, since Alaric is still running around between Illyrica and the Italian peninsula, the tribes flocked to the banner of Alaric, this powerful warlord, and he led them all to the gates of Rome in the year 410. It took a while to organize everything, but they camped out outside of Rome, and they threatened to sack the city. They demanded justice. They demanded a recognition that they had legal status in the Roman Empire, and that they were the warriors who were charged with defending the Roman Empire, and, you know, you just don't slaughter your own. Uh, they wanted to be recognized as the Romans that they firmly believed they were. Alaric also wanted recognition of the promises of Stilicho. Stilicho was the ruler who had the authority to make Alaric a general. 
and the senators, after Stilicho's death, said, nope, sorry, the promises of Stilicho died with Stilicho, you're still a, just a Germanic tribesman, we can smell you coming and we don't like you much. Uh, it was insulting. Alaric did not want to follow through on his threat. What he wanted was to have recognition from the Romans, and we're going to talk about this at much greater detail when we talk about the, cr the crisis and the tragedy that was the Roman and barbarian uh, relationship in the 5th century. But for now, it's, it's, it's enough to note that the senators had no interest in, in acceding to Alaric's request. Now you say, why would, the, why would they not? They don't want to be sacked. Well, they're not in Rome. The senators who are being told, give me my money, give me my title, or I'll sack Rome, uh, apologize, if you will, for the treatment of my fellow Germanic tribesmen, or I'll sack Rome, give us a guarantee that we'll be safe in the empire that welcomed us once, or we'll sack Rome. Those senators didn't live in Rome. The people who did live in Rome sent desperate letters saying, give him what he wants. They sent him to Ravenna, where the senators were. The senators, and this shows probably the, the, the moral decadence of what was left of the western half of the empire at this point, I have to agree with Edward Gibbon on that, the senators said no. And so Alaric, who didn't want to sack Rome, spent three days sacking Rome. Alaric sacked Rome. Of course, this wasn't the seat of power, but it had symbolic value. For the Roman Empire... Uh, this was devastating. It would happen twice more in the next century, but it hadn't happened for 800 years at this point, not since the Gauls, or if we want to call them that, the Celts, sacked Rome in the 4th century BCE. From this point on, the Roman emperor in the West would be the puppet of Germanic chieftains. Stilicho was the last genuine Roman general of course, the Romans in the West called him a barbarian because of his dad. The culture and governance of the old empire would decline as these very chieftains engaged in their own civil wars. And that's just a, a short summary of what happens. I'll tell you a whole lot more about the Germans in Lecture 3, because understanding them is key to understanding Western identity. Uh, the West is not built on the greatness of Rome. It's certainly not built on the greatness of Greece. It's built upon the tenacity of the barbarian chieftains who refused to be anything less in their own minds and as much as they could in reality than Roman citizens and the heirs of old Rome. The fact that they weren't uh, is just more of a tragic failure than anything else. The revolt of Constantine III in the north fell apart when his own general in Spain, a fellow by the name of Garantius, rebelled against him, rebelled against Constantine in 409, and set up yet another rival emperor, so now you've got three supposed emperors in the west, a chap by the name of Maximus. Anorius managed to replace Stilicho with another general, not quite the status and, and ability of Stilicho, but a hell of a guy in his own right, a fellow by the name of Constantius, uh, who defeated both Constantine and Garantius in exactly the same year, 411, and ensured that there was only one de facto emperor in, on, in the peninsula, and that was, that was Honorius. Now, Honorius is still very young. Without Stilicho's guidance in rulership, he doesn't do much. Uh, the real power at this period of time is the massive uh, Gothic uh, group of immigrants that, that, that is inhabiting Italy after Alaric's sack of Rome. But Constantius manages to pull this off with the old Roman system. He's really the last old Roman-style general in the West. As a result of the constant infighting among the old Roman uh, crowd, a tribe called the Franks crossed the Rhine 
and increasingly seized control of Gaul. You know, and who can blame them, really, because as they're looking around Gaul, the one thing they notice is there aren't any Romans there anymore. They're all down in the Italian peninsula, killing each other in this civil war in Spain. So the Franks come in. There's a lot of unclaimed land. There's no Romans to say they can't. So they come in and start settling in Gaul. Uh, again, not, not an overt act of war on the part of the Franks. It's an overt act of settlement. And by putting the Rhine between themselves and any enemies to the east, that's a pretty good defensive barrier. We'll talk more on this later, but in 418 there was a long overdue agreement in the west with the Gothic residents, which ceded to them the area of southern Gaul, or as we call it today, the Riviera. Riviera. Not a bad place to have control of if you're a barbarian chieftain. Hey, nifty. Uh, to think my ancestors left Poland, and we made good by taking over the Riviera. The agreement included the right to, right to gather one-third of the taxes for themselves in that, peer, in that area of southern Gaul, and it was particularly smart because the Goths who settled there were separated from the Eastern Roman Empire, where they had worn out their welcome under the banner of Alaric and others by sacking Roman towns and burning them to the ground, killing the inhabitants, other things that made the Eastern Empire not particularly fond of the Goths. Well, separating the two was a good deal, and the power in southern France and Spain is increasingly the Goths from that point on. In 423, Honorius died without an heir. In 424, and you can read about this in the book, uh, Gregory does a good job of tracing the genealogy here, Emperor Valentinian III, who is the son of Gala Placidia, the sister of Arcadius, that's who she is, and Honorius, and he's also the son of Constantius, the very general who settled the problems in 411 and managed to maintain some form of non-barbarian uh, military power in the Italian peninsula. He's named emperor by his cousin Theodosius II. Not that it matters much, because infighting and invasions continued. There is no centralized power to stop this. The Germanic tribes are warring among each other to see who gets to be the controller of the Roman throne in the West. And it's pretty much chaos at this point. Control rests where? With the military. And that means control rests with the Goths, the people who have enough soldiers and enough military might to, in, to impose their will. One chieftain or another was controlling a bewildering succession of emperors and ruling in all but name. The real rulers of the West, after the death of Honorius, are the Germanic chieftains. Emperor after emperor after emperor comes along. I don't even know how many there are. I count, and it depends on how you count them, of course, because sometimes one's considered an emperor by some people and not by others. Sometimes they don't last long enough to truly be crowned emperor. Uh, there are there are emperors that last a matter of of weeks, not even months. So, what you what you have to take from this is that the people controlling Italy aren't the emperors at all. They are the Goths. And the Goths themselves always see themselves as Romans, but Romans who are beset with a problem of the old population, A, not accepting them, and B, having to be controlled or further civil war ensues. The Goths thought of themselves as peacekeepers in the Italian peninsula, and as the people carrying on the heritage of old Rome. They saw the old Roman senatorial class as decadent, and the cause of the types of civil wars, under Constantine III, for example, which prevented the best parts of Rome from uh, coming to the fore, like peace, the Pax Romana. In 473, the Eastern Empire got sick of the strange succession of puppet empire emperors set up by Gothic chieftains, and they simply no longer recognized any Western emperors. This really started in 472, uh, but it was official in 473. The final one that they put forward, they're not interested in anyone forwarded by 
some barbarian in the west. The final one that's put forward in the east, uh, the emperor in the east declares Julian Nepos to be emperor of the west. But he really never lived in the west. He lived in Dalmatia, so he was kind of a king without a country or an emperor without an empire. The Goths still ran things in the west. Julius hung out at the villa in Dalmatia and never took control of his western holdings, if they were even that. By the year 476, and this is something I'll have to come back to in the German discussion again, the real power in the west was a Vis Visigoth named Flavius Odovacher. Odoacher or Odovacher. Uh, it's pronounced both ways. Sometimes it's spelled with a V. This barbarian chieftain acknowledged Julius Nepos as the real emperor of the West and pretty much ignored him because he knew he'd never move west to take his throne anyway. So Odovacher ruled as king of Italy, sometimes in the name of, of Julius Nepos and sometimes just in his own right. One thing I want to point out to you about Odovacher, which I think is, is important, his name is not just Odovacher, which is Visigothic. His name is Flavius, Roman, Odovacher. He saw himself as a Roman citizen, even if his fellow Roman citizens regarded him as a barbarian and unworthy of the status that he claimed. The uh, barbarian invasions then, and we'll talk about this more in the third lecture, the barbarian invasions are not the invasions of a bunch of mean-spirited Germanic tribesmen trying to take over the empire. They are the immigration of Germanic tribes who see themselves as an essential part of the empire. After all, who else is going to defend the glory of Rome? They were Romophiles. They loved Rome and they were willing to eliminate incompetent emperors when necessary to maintain Rome. More on that later. Back to the East. After uh, she took over, Pulcheria was the real power at court for pretty much the remainder of her life. She took a religious vow of virginity which was probably sincere at every level. It also hit, secured, however, her independence as a political figure. If she wanted to ensure that she would not be subject to a man and the man would not take power from her, her vow of virginity ensured that this would be so. Um, Elizabeth I, Queen of England, would have a similar situation. I suspect she wasn't a virgin, but that's because I study these things and there's good reason to say she probably wasn't, but she certainly maintained the image of not being married and not being anything but a virgin as a way of ensuring that no one could say, well, your consort or your husband or whoever is the real power, you're just a woman. Pulcheria was the real power. Her brother, weak-willed and not particularly interested in ruling, pretty much ceded all authority to Pulcheria. For a moment, and it wasn't much more than that, her power was put in check because Theodosius II, little brother, married Athene, the daughter of one of the few remaining pagan philosophers. She took the name Eudokia at her baptism. Had she not been a sincere Christian, she may not have been a threat to Pulcheria. The very fact, however, that Pulcheria, a very sincere and dedicated Christian woman, essentially a nun, uh, was a power in the court. And then Eudokia, also apparently converts wholeheartedly to Christianity, means that uh, Pulcheria can't just set her sister-in-law aside as, you know, this is my brother's wife. Um, Eudokia herself, a strong-willed woman and a very religious one, fits in with the court of Pulcheria. And because she fits in in the court of Pulcheria, I won't call it the court of Theodosius because it was he wasn't in power, she was. Because she fits in, she becomes a rival. Eudokia's conversion seems to be sincere. She, like Helena, the mother of Constantine, 
made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land in the year 438, and in the year 443, she chose to settle there permanently in a semi-monastic position, basically abandoning all her claims to power and fame in Constantinople to de dedicate herself to the religious life. Pulcheria, I won't say Theodosius because he didn't do anything, she did everything. Pulcheria continued the policy of fortifying the cities and towns of the east, as well as working diplomatic with, diplomatically with the Goths and Persians to keep warfare down. And yeah, this involved payments at some times, selected battles at others, but she balanced the, uh, she balanced the various competing interests quite well. The book doesn't say it this way, but because she was in power, I'll say it this way. She also oversaw the issuance of a somewhat streamlined but very much unreformed version of Roman law, the Codex Theodosianus, named after Theodosius, but she was certainly in the court as the, the powerful ruler when it came out. There were a lot of laws that were still contradictory, and there were some laws that were cruel, even by Roman standards, that were in the Codex Theodosianus, these were generally not enforced or uh, ever brought into play in the, Rome, in the legal system, but they remained on the books because once you take a law off the books, well, how do you bring it back? In the year 450, Theodosius II dies in a hunting accident. Not too surprising for those who knew him because he was, after all, not an emperor as much as he was the person who went out and had fun while Pulcheria his sister, ruled the empire. Now, there's some concern in the 5th century that Pulcheria really should not rule in her own right, even though she'd been doing it for most of her brother's adult life. She needed a man. And so, under advice from her uh, council, she marries an, an old soldier, very accomplished fellow who had... Uh, had a family, wife and family before, had his own kids before, pretty much the end of his career, close to the end of his life, Marcion. Very competent guy, and his intelligence is what made the marriage. The agreement between the two is that her vow of virginity would be respected. So, no, this was not a marriage of love, it was a marriage of political convenience. He was old and capable, very intelligent, and he'd already gone around the block, he'd had his family, so he's not interested in, uh, in having marital relations, the standard, oh, well, let's call it sex, with Pulcheria. He respected her virginity. They ruled because that was the best way to govern the empire. Two competent people, each making sure that the empire did what it was supposed to do. Marcion was a colleague of a chap by the name of Aspar the Allen. He would, Aspar was the leader of the Gothic faction of the military, although uh, Gregory's entirely correct. He himself was not Germanic. And Marcion was as shrewd as Pulcheria. She chose well. She knew what she was doing in choosing a co-ruler, not so much a husband, but a co-ruler of the empire. Among other things, it was Marcion's calculated decisions to stop paying off Attila the Hun, because he said Attila knows better than to attack. He probably wouldn't win in the east. He would besiege our cities and waste all of his forces doing so. Um, since 434, Attila had been receiving annual payments. The empire had money, and they certainly didn't want war if it could be bought off. Attila when he thought about his chances, apparently agreed with Marcion that, nope, I probably wouldn't stand a chance if I attack the Eastern Empire, so I'm going to head west and attack the Western Empire. And indeed he does. He, he gets to the gates of Rome. And you may know the story, uh, 451, 452. And at the gates of Rome, he doesn't sack Rome because at the very moment when you think he's going to sack Rome, he dies. Huh. Rather anticlimactic when you think about it. Pulcheria died in the year 453. Marcion died four years later. The Eastern Empire was stable and solvent. It was in very good shape empire-wise. But the West had been largely ignored.
After the death of Marcion, the military took over, and Marcion's friend and colleague, Asper the Allen, uh, decided to settle the succession question his own way. Perhaps Asper should be known as the pseudo Allen. Allens are a Germanic tribe. The Allens are a, uh, like the, the, the Goths generally, it's the, kind of the over, the, the big name for all the sub tribes, but uh, Visigoths, Ostrogoths, Allens, Suaves, these are all Germanic tribes. He was not a member of the Germanic tribe, but he apparently had joined with them and kind of gone native although he was truly the native, he kind of went goth in uh, fashioning his own identity. He dressed like them, he ate their food, icky as it was to the, to the more vegetarian-oriented Romans. He was eating meat cooked in meat, which was seasoned with fat and other parts of animals, uh, as opposed to eating the good food cooked in olive oil and... and uh, uh, seasoned with vegetables, that that was typical of the Roman diet. He styled his hair according to the Germanic tradition. Ick. Uh, he wore trousers. Ooh. He was generally rude, cr rude, crude, and socially unacceptable. But he was very respected by the Germanic tribesmen, who were the force of the military at the time. He managed to unite and control the Germans in service of the empire. In addition to adopting barbarian style, hairstyle, and clothing style, he also adopted barbarian religion, which meant he was an Aryan Christian, rather than being a Catholic or what we might call an Orthodox Christian. Who are you going to choose for emperor when the former empress died in a perpetual vow of virginity, and her husband Marcion didn't want any of his family moving into uh, being emperor because you know, it's not very, not very healthy. Who would wish this on somebody they loved? Aspar chose one of his personal staff, a cruel and capable man who uh, goes down in history as Leo the First, and Leo the First would reign from 457, the death of Marcion, to the year 474. Leo sent Anthemios the uh, husband of Marcion's daughter, Marcion's son-in-law then, to take charge of the West. Anthemios was supposed to be the co-emperor, but Anthemios was murdered by the Magister Militans, uh, now just a title for the main Gothic chieftain, in the, in the year 472. Uh, he never really had a chance of taking control in the West. He stuck it out, he made a good face of it, until Rikimer decided, hey, we don't need you. You're just a puppet of the Eastern, Eastern power, and he offed him. What this produced is the choice of Julius Nepos, which I mentioned earlier in 473. From the time he became emperor, Leo used the Asarian regiments. This is a tribal group in Asia Minor, and Gregory has a pretty dis good description of who the Asarians are. We'll meet them again multiple times in the next few hundred years of Byzantine history. He used the Asarians to establish his own control over against Aspar. He had his own army, in other words. He didn't need the Gothic regiments. Uh, the Asarian regiments were capable of standing their ground against uh, the Germans, if need be. Leo took the Asarian Zeno, who... Uh, whose Asarian name was Tarasus, changed it to Zeno when he became a political functionary in Constantinople. Leo made him both his lieutenant, his right-hand man, and his son-in-law, marrying him to his daughter Ariadne. And Leo used Zeno then to break from Aspar's control. Leo no longer needed the military of Aspar, he had his own. Thank you very much. Uh, Aspar and his son... Adoburos were found murdered in 471, probably at the hands of Leo. Careful who your friends are. Uh, Asper chose one of his own and was murdered by his choice. With the death of Leo I, just a few years later in 74, his grandson Baizino, 
Leo II, who was at the time a six-year-old, inherited the throne. But as soon as he was crowned, but as soon as he inherited, he immediately crowned his father Zeno as emperor. You know, six-year-old says, "Hey, Dad, have a crown." And suddenly, after crowning Zeno as emperor, Leo I, the real emperor, but according to the will of uh, Leo, died. Is it murder? The charge came immediately that Zeno had killed his own son so that he would be the sole emperor. Maybe, but I think it's a bit doubtful. Under this charge, Zeno fled briefly but was helped back to power by Theodoric, and we will encounter him again when we talk more fully about the Germans. An Ostrogoth chieftain who, among all the Goths we've studied, was far more Roman in his sentiments and his mentality than, uh, than the title Ostrogothic chieftain would suggest. He thought of himself as the preserver of Rome. And bringing Zeno back to power was one way that Theodoric propped up the power of Constantinople, and he would move west and have an effect there as well. In 488, Theodoric and the Ostrogoths, his tribe, or tribal system, there's quite a few tribes among the Ostrogoths, invade Italy to confront uh, Odovacher, who we met on the last slide. As a result, and we'll have to talk about this more, Ravenna, the capital of the Western Empire now, flourished with Theodoric ruler, ruling as an emperor in all, all but name, and since Theodoric loved all things Byzantine and all things Roman, uh, fantastic mosaics and works of art were established in Ravenna. If you ever have the chance to go to Ravenna, see the baptistry, the cathedral, these are actually the buildings and the art put in place by Theodoric himself when he functioned as the de facto Western emperor or ruler of the empire. He always had a puppet emperor who was technically the emperor, but he himself held all the power. Anastasius I uh, takes over after Zeno, roughly 491 to 515, 519 or 518. Anastasios was promoted by Zeno's widow as the next emperor. He was also from a military background, also a fellow who had risen through the ranks. Anastasios was tremendously successful as a general and as a manager of affairs, but he was also something of an isolationist. The last thing he wanted to think about was all the work it would take to sort out the problems in the West. It was enough for him to make sure that the East was stable and secure. And this, then, is the legacy he leaves to Justinian, the fascinating figure at so many levels, which will be the subject of our next lecture. Boy, that's a lot of stuff. I am now on the final line of the final slide of Lecture 1, and uh, you've put up with enough. I've, I've ho I hope you've had the time to uh, stick with this one. hope you've got a few questions down. It's a lot of names, dates, and places in the political section of, of the lecture. We're going to come back and look at the intellectual changes, which means religious changes, because religious and intellectual changes are the same in the Byzantine Empire, and also at the Germanic tribes more closely when we have time. But thanks for sticking with me. It's now way early in the morning. My fire is dying. My coffee's running out. And I will see you all on Wednesday. I hope to have another recorded lecture if I get the chance, but if not, this should set you up well enough for us to talk about uh, Justinian when we meet again. Take care.